Well, thank you, Andrew, for the wonderful welcome. It's so exciting to be here with you virtually. Um, and today we're going to talk about a topic that's very dear to me, which is we deserve rights. So let's first, I want to cover one quick thing with you, which is that this talk is completely dedicated to all the hackers who's ever been scared to disclose. I know some of you are probably joining and you may have been one of those folks. And to all the hackers who have been persecuted for trying to do something good or just actually doing their job surprisingly. And to all the people who are in the fight to bring rights for hackers and for you for coming to this talk, because even though we're in security, we really need to discuss about policies such as federal policies and how much of an impact they have. But also it's about time we have some sort of protections because at this time we still have zero protections when we disclose vulnerabilities. So this talk is gonna dive into that. Um, but my name is Chloe Mistagi. I am a strategy consultant and researcher. I'm also the advisor for Hacking is Not a Crime. I also co-founded it. I'm also the co-founder of We Open Tech, uh, which is an organization that helps to empower um, and provide a community for marginalized genders. So you gotta have gender e equality and equity, and this is what we try to do. Um, also ITSP Magazine uh, for the Change Making Podcast. And also I'm an advice columnist for Security Boulevard. So if there's anything that you want to know about myself or anything of the work that I do, feel free to reach out um, you know, on Twitter, Instagram. Also, I love getting connected on LinkedIn. So if you want to connect with me, I would love to connect with you. Um, and if you have feedback from this talk, even more wonderful, I always want to do as best as I can. So if you have any great tips, I would love that. Um, that is my URL, so standoutintech.com. Um, but let's get into the real reason why you're here. So I mentioned a little bit earlier that I co-founded a organization called Hacking is Not a Crime. And what we do is basically it's a grassroots movement. Um, you may have seen this on Twitter next to certain people's profiles. Um, Hacking is not a crime, or we also call ourselves HINAC. But basically what we're trying to do as a community as a whole is to come together and try to make a difference by challenging the public perceptions of the hackers. Because in reality, that's what this talk is gonna be talking about is what can we do to finally get rights and protections? And then until we change public perception, we have absolutely no future on getting protections. So if you wanna get involved in Hacking Is Not A Crime or learn more about it, just feel free to go to hackingisnotacrime.org. But for those that are probably getting a little bit strange, the fact that I'm talking about hackers, getting rights for hackers, you may be associating the term hackers with attackers. And I just wanna be very specific here that there's two different parties in our community. We have those that are hackers, um, also known as security researchers. And then we have attackers or criminals or cyber criminals or malicious actors. And basically the difference between the two is that the intent. So they use the same set of skills to find vulnerabilities, but the difference is, is that one's gonna report that vulnerability, the other one is never gonna report that vulnerability. Instead, they're gonna use it for their own gains. So there's a huge difference. So if I say hacker, it does mean security researcher. When I use the term attacker, it doesn't mean hackers, it means those that are involved in criminal activities. And I think it's first now we can go into the real situation that we're in, which is the current landscape for hackers. Right now, we don't have any rights. So just thought I should let everyone know ahead of time, the reason this talk is around is because we have absolutely no rights nor protections. And even when we're reporting things, um, you know, vulnerabilities to organizations, Sometimes we're either ignored or sometimes we have to worry about legal issues. Just in this case, for example, um, you may have been familiar with Kevin's case, um, which basically is about reporting a bug to DJI, which you probably know as the drone manufacturer. Well, the backstory here is that DJI uh, created their own bug bounty program. And what do I mean by that? That means that they didn't partner with like HackerOne or Bug Crowd. They basically decided to do their own. And it's a lot of work to do a bug bounty program on your own because it takes, you know, more than one person to manage it um, and to keep tabs of 
the bugs that are reported, making sure they remain patched, having conversations with the hacker who basically disclosed the vulnerabilities and making sure people stay in scope. It's a lot of work, but DJI decided they wanted to do it on their own at that time, and they just launched it. So Kevin and his friend, Sean, basically came across their bug bounty program, and they sent an email wanting to just confirm what was in scope. And it took them two weeks to respond. This is a red flag right there. Once again, it lets you know that they may be taking a little bit too much at one time when first starting. And so Kevin basically found a vulnerability after getting the two weeks of confirmation. And he reports this vulnerability and they offered him 30K. And this is great, right? Kevin's like, ah, I got 30K for this bug. However, to receive those funds, he would have to sign a contract. And this contract didn't offer any protections for him. So instead he responded saying, I don't want the funds, it's okay. And he thought that would be it. However, internally DJI was panicking. They were thinking that this could become a big PR situation and they saw him as a threat. So then what they did was that they sent him a letter, which is what you see on this screen. I know you can't probably read it, but you can go to his blog post and find it. But the letter itself basically said that he went out of scope, even though he did stay within scope based on the email that he sent confirming the scope that took two weeks to do. And the unfortunate bit was that because they claimed that he was out of scope, that he basically broke the CFA, the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act. And this is a really scary situation to be you know, attacked under this certain type of legislation. And so Kevin, basically, the good news was that Kevin was like, well, this is a, this is a complete nightmare. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to publish every single communication I've ever had with DJI, and that's it. And I'm going to walk away. And when he did, there even included internal conversations that they didn't know that he had eyes on. They didn't, they didn't see that within the chain, there was discussions internally of labeling him as a PR threat. Anyway, as you can possibly imagine, damage was definitely done um, because when he posted it, DJ had gotten some pretty heavy dark waters afterwards by the press. And they they decided to not pursue uh, going after him anymore with legal action. So with Kevin's case, it's one of those things that's a reminder for us to acknowledge that even though you have bug bounty programs and vulnerability disclosure policies, even when someone reports, they're still afraid to report because you know companies have been using it to attack researchers. And we've seen this over and over and over again in the community. And this is the problem that we face, that at this time, one out of four researchers will disclose a vulnerability. And the reason for that is it's either ignored when they report it, or they get thrown with a lawsuit, which that we saw that happened in the case of Kevin. So how do we fix this? How do we get protections and rights so then people like Kevin would be protected from even a legal action targeting him when he was in the right. And the reality is that we have to influence the public because the public plays a huge part in anything that happens in our country or anywhere around the world, the public influences decisions and can influence change. It can also create movements as well. And to be able to influence the public cycle, you have to work with the media, which is you know social media and the press, also marketing. Um, you also have to work with organizations that have to make sure they have vulnerability disclosure policies and also to hold them accountable when they do come after one of our researchers in our community that was trying to disclose something and was either ignored or threatened. Also, we have to update our legislation. We have legislation that from the 80s that still really makes an impact on us to this day. And before we go into how do we influence the media organizations and legislation to help us get rights for hackers, we first need to dive into humans. 
overall, how does human behavior work? Because by knowing how a human behavior tends to work out, it allows us to understand what we need to do to influence a change. And you may have heard basically this term, socially constructed beliefs. So basically socially constructed beliefs are these ideas that humans have created that are constructed in order to make sense of the world that they live in. And it's very objective. Um, it's basically what we see in experiences that influence and put things into categories. It helps us basically try to figure out who's like us, who's not like us. Um, and also it's a way of seeing things black and white, which is not the way we're supposed to be seeing things. Humans are complex. It's very hard to put people into groups. It's more like everyone's on some sort of shade of gray, but socially constructed beliefs are not always accurate. And that's the huge thing here to take away. So how do socially constructed beliefs, how do they play a role? Well, it's broken down into three different parts. So we have part one, which is fear. So how that works exactly is, say for example, when you grew up, um, everything around you, like in your books, anytime you put on the TV, anytime you watched a movie, anytime you heard an adult have a conversation, that randomly just using this, that a person with pink hair is a dangerous individual. So anytime a book or a movie shows a person with pink hair, it's always a criminal. So every time that you now see someone with pink hair, you think that that person could be a criminal because you've seen it everywhere around you. You've even heard adults talking about it or teachers talking about it indirectly or reading in your book or turn on the news. It always seems that the person with pink hair is someone dangerous. And so this is a belief that you bought into as a young child. And still to this day, you may still follow it. And so what happens is in your brain, you compartmentalize people. Um, you have these socially constructive beliefs, and those could actually stem from who's like me, who's not like me. And based on that itself, there's a part of your brain called the amygdala, which is your fight versus flight mechanism. You may have heard of it before. It's like an almond-shaped tissue um, inside your brain um, that is completely subconscious. But it's basically alerting you to let you know that, hey, you're in survival mode, or if you're not in survival mode. But it's usually activated when we're afraid. So in the example of the pink hair as being a dangerous individual, say, for example, that you're walking down the street and behind you, there's someone with pink hair. So your amygdala is sending a warning saying, warning, warning, person with pink hair behind you, be careful. It sends now a message to the prefrontal cortex where it verifies the threat. And the prefrontal cortex, which is just in the front part of your brain, it works like the CEO of your brain. Basically, it uses logic and reason to break down the potential threat being perceived by your amygdala that's sending that warning that you're maybe in danger. So at this time, when that person with pink hair is behind you, the amygdala sent that signal to the prefrontal cortex saying warning, you know, person with pink hair behind you based on that socially constructed belief, remember? So now in your brain, you're breaking it down, what you can do. So you're thinking, okay, so the person with pink hair, there's a high chance that person could be a criminal. So I could either cross the street, I could go into the store, or I could clutch my bag just a little bit tighter just to be on the safe side. Or maybe one more thought comes to mind, which is don't act at all. And usually we always forget about that one last bit. Um, however, there is a way how you can influence that. So say for example, that you saw a video on YouTube and it was someone with pink hair. And all they were talking about was that it is a really hard life to have because of their hair color. Based on the hair color alone, that people perceive them as criminals. And so when they walk in for a job interview, they don't get that position because people have this socially constructed belief that has been bought by society that people with pink hair are dangerous individuals. Or the fact that the person with pink hair is also talking in their vlog that it hurts them when they see people cross the street, go into the store or clutch their bag a little bit tighter just because they're right behind someone. And say that you're back in that situation now. You're back in the street. Remember, you had three or well, four choices to make. The first one is crossing the street, 
to get away from the person with pink hair behind you. Going into the store is the second one. The third option is to clutch your bag a little bit tighter. And the last one is to not take action. And suddenly your memory gets jogged a little bit in this one moment. And it's like, hey, hold on one sec. By crossing that street, clutching your bag or going to the store, you're basically going to be possibly hurting this person's feelings behind you with the pink hair. And you saw that YouTube video and that was really hard for them. Maybe you should take a step back. And at that moment, you decide not to take action. Because the reality is that socially constructed beliefs can always be challenged. It means that we have to get in our uncomfortableness. That means we have to get outside our bubble to understand the world, how it works and how it functions. But it's so important that we question our biases because they play a huge role. Because also people are seeing us as bad individuals because we see it in the movies and TV shows and our books. You know, we always get these weird images about the hacker community. And because of that, people are afraid of us and they see us as not like them. So they're always going to think of hackers as criminals. But there are ways how you can get involved. And the first one that you can do is uh, go to hackisnotacrime.org. There is a hacker stories project, which basically various different people in the hacker community made a recording of themselves talking about why they became a hacker and the issues that they've been facing since being a hacker and why it means so much for them to have protection. And you can also participate if you like too. you just record a video and the instructions are also placed on our site. Because the reality of all of this is that to be able to influence the public perception of hackers, we have to work together as a community to challenge those public perceptions. Because right now, as we have learned, is that socially constructed beliefs stem from the media, like in our movies, our books, our news, our social media, and marketing. Because it's through images, images like these, that if you were to type in ethical hacker or even criminal hacker, you would get the exact same image, that dark hoodie figure, sometimes with a ski mask. And it, that's not what we look like at all. And that's the most annoying part but it's these images that are holding us back from having rights and protections because it's feeding into the socially constructed belief that hackers are dangerous individuals. But also the terms that are being used because still to this day, a lot of the press still reports hackers as criminals, you know, using the term hackers when they should be using the term attackers or criminals. And the language does play a huge role because of that. And it really does hurt when the media doesn't know the difference between a hacker and an attacker. And they really, they don't know better because they haven't been told most likely or they haven't been corrected. Um, so they're just trying to do their job. So it's best for us to also acknowledge that this is a situation because we're getting these things. For example, hackers can turn your home computer into a bomb. That is not what a hacker would do. That's what an attacker would do. Or hackers post pornography in a, in a virtual classroom. Do you think a hacker, anyone from the hacker community would do that? No. That's someone who has something for their own gain. It's an intent, remember? Or a hacker threatening to leak patients' therapy notes. We already know. They don't want to do that either because we understand that's confidential. We stay within scope. So what we have to do is correct them nicely. So that means when we talk to the press is to remind them that there's two separate parties. This is going to help us quite a bit. And you can do this very easy. One is always remember to be kind because nothing will ever happen or nothing is ever going to get changed if we aren't kind to one another. The last thing you want to do is start an argument with someone from the press. That's never going to bridge a conversation. That's just going to cause a situation. Um, but you can always DM or comment publicly. Just always remember to be nice, okay? They don't know better. Have empathy. And you can, you can do this by calling out on Twitter. Uh, we've had people do that. And remember the reasons why. Um, you can also feel free to tag um, Hack Not Crime on Twitter uh, because a lot of our are basically, we have these advocates, they will also step in to help the conversation. 
Uh, so you can do it uh, with marketing. A lot of times in information security or cybersecurity companies, they will basically use the image of the hooded figure, uh, use the terms hackers instead of attackers. And this is one of those things that we need to definitely fix. So you can also do that as well. Um, you can also give them kudos when they get it right, because that does mean quite a bit. And one of my favorites is sending a letter to the copy desk. So this is one that we sent to the New York Times. Um, but basically, this allows for the editorial team to make sure that the reporters are using the right language. So always send a letter to a copy desk, letting them know, hey, one of the things that you featured um, had this problem, used the wrong terms. And I just want to share with you why this matters to get it correctly. Also, if you are someone who does talk to the press here and there, make sure that you always let that reporter know. Um, that when you say the term hacker, you mean security researchers. And when you use the term attacker, that means the person who is the criminal. And that hackers and attackers are two separate parties. So anytime you do comment to the press, you want to remind them um, to make sure they use the correct terminology. And also, if you're doing anything on video or anything like it, please don't wear a hoodie on a camera. And the reason for that is because we have to challenge those images that are all over Google. So if you wear a hoodie on camera, you're just feeding into the situation and you're just going to make it 10 times even harder for us to try to get rights and protections. So if you can challenge that public perception thought. That means if you want to wear a tux, you can wear a tux. If you want to wear a suit, you can wear a suit. If you want to wear a gala dress, go for it. The thing is, don't dress up like how everyone has stereotyped the hacker community. Dress differently because that makes someone have to challenge their beliefs and thoughts of what they think the world works like. Because the reality is that if we don't do these things, if we don't step up as a community, we're gonna keep having results in the media. And this is gonna be our continuous vicious cycle of an impact, such as that 94% of Forbes 2000 still don't have vulnerability disclosure policies. That means that anytime we find a vulnerability and we wanna report it, we don't know who to go to. And this becomes one of those situations that's are hard because then we have to go through social media to contact someone, which we know goes to the marketing team. And then the marketing team will either block it from going to the security team, by bringing it to their legal team or PR team. This is a huge problem. So it's really important to have vulnerability disclosure policies. The other thing is that one out of four hackers don't report vulnerabilities as we've covered before why, and that the laws right now, such as the CFA and DMCA is really holding us back and it's really out of date. I mean, it's from the eighties. We're not, we're like really far from then. Um, but also the prosecuting of hackers, which we still see to this day. And it's not uh, federally as much, anymore, I would say, since I think 2016 has been reduced significantly. Instead, we're having more of it of uh, tech companies going after the hacker community. Um, and also you see it with local or county and statewide, they may be using the CFA against you. Um, the other thing is because of our situation, we're also making it almost impossible for, you know, people to have this as their day job. Um, especially when we're gatekeeping people in our community, they have the great skills to use and they may turn to another way um, so then they can make an income. So this is something to think about is that when we create a legal path and we provide protection, this will decrease the number of bad actors instead. And that's something that we need to do. Because the reason that some end up going this route is because they never got any rights or protection. They've been threatened too many times. And then they get to a point like, what's the point of me like doing all this stuff and not even getting paid for it or being treated this way? That's how you create bad actors sometimes. So that's something to consider. So when you influence the media, and the media does play a huge role in influence legislation because politicians pay attention to the press and also political movements. And right now laws prevent good hacking in the same way they prevent attackers. And we really do need good hacking because it does keep us safe. And so there are a couple of things to think of. So when it comes to legislation that impacts us, that is your um, anti-hacking laws. In the US, we have the CFA. 
Um, that also means your copyright laws in the US is the DMCA. And also you have your uh, terms and conditions. So those are the three that play a massive role when it comes to reporting vulnerabilities, um, but also being a hacker in the community. And of course, the good news is that with the DMCA, we are having more of that right to repair movement. It's been in the press quite a bit. So fingers crossed it, that will be updated some point soon uh, because it does play a, a chilling effect for us. Now, on the CFAA, the reason I have a problem with it is, well, first, the origins. The origins, if you don't know, is that uh, Ronald Reagan basically watched war games and flat out panicked. It was like, we got to do something about these hackers. And so basically created the CFAA based off of that movie War Games that really made him afraid of us. And of course, when legislation was written, our group was not part of that conversation. And when you don't have interest groups in part of the conversation when it comes to legislation, that's going to hurt a great party right there. Um, so it's that's one of the issues. So the CFA has been misused by prosecution to go after um, hackers in the community. It's also very vague and there's lots of redundancies in it. And this is one of those things that it's such a pain to have. But unfortunately, the CFA, the other thing to note about it, it has been used so many times against people in our community. And one of those cases, which is the most hardest one to think about is Aaron Swartz. So in 2011, Carmen Ortez, who was the US Attorney's Office role, um, basically charged Swartz with hacking into the MIT computer network to download millions of scholarly articles from JSTOR, which was kind of an act of civil disobedience um, meant to protest the restricted access to text uh, uh, research because the research that people were doing was funded by taxpayers. And so he wanted to make sure that people had access to it because they paid taxes to it. But because of that, the US attorney brought charges that carried a maximum of 35 years in prison and $1 million in fines. Now, I want you to understand that for a case of murder in the US, the minimum is 25 years. He was looking at 35 years in prison for articles. Yeah, it's kind of ridiculous because the way that CFA is written, it allowed them to do that. And it's one of those things that if, if we were Aaron in this situation, imagine that you were dealing with a 17 month long legal battle that you had no idea when it was going to end. And it must have been really overwhelming for him. I cannot imagine what he went through on that. And unfortunately, we lost him. He, the cause of death was due to suicide um, in his apartment. And so the one thing to keep in mind is that after he passed away, his family did state that they believe that the reason he ended his life was because of these charges impacted him so significantly and he was overwhelmed. And that is one of the things that it is definitely not okay. That's letting you know we have a problem. And yes, there was a legislation that was run called the Aaron's Law. And Aaron's Law was something that was created to protect other secure researchers so they don't have a situation that Aaron Swartz went through. And it was called the Aaron's Law. But unfortunately, it was blocked. Um, and the reason for that was that there was a good number of tech, like big tech companies that were lobbying. And so this prevented Aaron's law from becoming a reality. And that's where we stand today with CFA is that we still have this problem. But if we have improvements with legislation, that means that Forbes Global 2000 would all have vulnerability disclosure policies. That means 100% of hackers could report vulnerabilities without fear. And also they would be taken seriously, but also laws that encourage good hacking. Talk about gatekeeping, right? We could get rid of gatekeeping and this would help quite a bit, <laughs> but also no more prosecuting hackers. Those that are staying within scope and are not using for malicious intent, they should be protected. And also it would definitely decrease the number of malicious actors. So what can you do right now? Be bold and be kind. 
But also note that by being bold, it means sharing our stories. If we don't, someone else will. And you may not like what they say. So why not go forward about it? Also voting. There's one thing that you should have taken away in the past couple of years is vote. Your vote does matter. I know who your local representatives are because you can always connect with them and get a meeting. And if you are concerned or scared to do it alone, feel free to reach out to Hacky is Not a Crime. Many of our members would love to help you out and attend that meeting as well. And we can prep you for it as well. And step four of all of this is to collaborate with organizations. So first things first, vulnerability disclosure, every single organization, especially those that are security companies, should have vulnerability disclosure policies. Because without it, hackers aren't going to report vulnerabilities that they find. Instead, attackers are going to find the vulnerabilities and never report it and take advantage of you. Which one is better? Yeah, that's what I thought. So why vulnerability disclosure? Well, it reduces breaches because someone's reporting that vulnerabilities because diverse backgrounds can find bugs that your security team cannot find. And that's okay. That doesn't mean that you have a bad team. That just means that you need other outside sources to help. That's what we do as a community. Also, it allows a bilateral trust between ORs and hackers to keep security in check. And let's be real with one another. Scanners are great to a certain extent, but they really, you can't rely on them. So how can you improve this is state what's in scope and what's out of scope. And don't write it for attorneys, write it for English learners, because there's people all over the world that want to report a vulnerability, but they need to also understand now, when it comes to like terms and conditions, when we look at, say, for example, an Apple product, sometimes those things are 50 pages long and it's written for one attorney to another attorney to understand. This is a huge problem for us. Make it very simple, straight to the point. Imagine English learners. Contact information. Knowing who to contact is incredibly important. For many of us, it is one of the pains in the world because it'll take hours, days, weeks to find contact information. And then you kind of give up if you can't find it. So you want to really state what your contact information is and communicate with every update. All of us want to know, has it been patched yet? What does this look like? Having a good conversation is really, really important. So always have someone who's a point person at your company to manage that conversation. Also having a dedicated person, like I said, to manage and prioritize and task, that's something important. If you can't do that in-house, make sure that you look at you know, other companies that do, such as HackerOne, BugCrowd, Synac. There's plenty of other ones out there, but it may be a good idea to do that, especially if you're a small shop or a medium-sized shop. If you want some additional help on that, go to a disclose.io. It does provide you everything you could possibly know how to create a good vulnerability disclosure policies. They even have examples for you as well. But there's also this GitHub listing of all the companies that are practicing Safe Harbor. And so that's something to also consider. So if your company is practicing Safe Harbor or have vulnerability disclosure policies, make sure you add them to it, that list. So then, you know, those that are hackers in the community, they can find that and know who to contact. But also know that this is an organization that's supporting and trying to protect hackers and wanting to build that bridge between. And besides disclosure, you can always volunteer and give. You can volunteer time or finances, but the thing is, work with these groups. They're working so hard to get rights for us. So that's the EFF, I'm a Calvary, CERT CC, CTI League, Disclose.io, and Hacking is That a Crime. So big summary, and I hope I'm doing good on time here, is get involved by visiting Hacking is That a Crime to learn how you can get involved early. And you can become an advocate with us as well if you're interested. Um, volunteer and support orgs that are trying to work to help the community. Also, feel free to record a video to tell your story and participate in the Hacker Stories project. Like I said, you control your story by participating. And remember to work with the press and keep them informed and have as much empathy as possible and be kind. Because the reality is that we'll never have change unless you take that step forward or I take that step forward. And yeah, one person can make a huge difference. So by 
wanting to change how the dynamics are for the hackers in our community, change starts with you and me because we have the ability to do that. And I know it seems like an impossible task sometimes when we look at our community and we're looking at legislation and we know that politicians don't really know too much about cybersecurity. I know, I know, I get it. It's really hard. But that's why we have conversations with them. That's why we also work with the press. That's why we work with organizations to have vulnerability disclosure policies because organizations and the press can help influence legislators to take action. And we can start a movement to try to get action as well. So thank you all so much for existing. I know I wrap things up probably early, but that's because I know that you may have lots of questions and I wanna make sure that I can answer all of them to the full depth of whatever you wanna ask. <laughs>